Hello and welcome to On Source Wall. My name is Elvis and as always, I'm your host. Okay, so I think I'm pretty much over this bug, but as you know, these scares have affected a lot of things. So please be safe out there, everyone, and hope you're doing well and taking all necessary precautions. Now, because of all this, there are some news topics, but the only one I'm really interested in and the only one that really did blindside me, even though it was obvious, was that, of course, New Mutants got pushed back again. I don't think we have a release date anymore. I think... In all honesty, they would be better off to push it back until November because November has a Friday 13th in it and the plan at least from the jump, was always to market this as kind of a horror movie. And the original release date, if you remember, was April 13, 2018, which was a Friday 13. So if they're going to push it back, I would hope they at least take advantage of that to, you know, try to get some old school synergy going. But, you know, it's a shame. I was really excited for it. It was only two or three weeks away at this point, And damn it, we we're so close. We we're so close. The only upshot of this is that because it's being pushed back again and again, but never officially canceled, that means that the X-Men Cinematic Universe that Fox started isn't really over. It's still going on. It's kind of like the Scorpion King, which had like five sequels that lasted up until 2019. The last one came out in 2019, which means, funnily enough, that that continuity, the Mummy Brandon Fraser series, they outlasted the Dark Universe, the Mummy Tom Cruise one. It lasted longer than that one, and that's funny to me. So in any case, my hope is that at least the new mutants might be able to outlast and bury the MCU. Now, we do have one question connected to this from Knott on Twitter, and... Their question is, is the movie cursed or is the world just not ready? And I'm going to say both, probably both. I don't think the world is ready for a good X-Men movie again. Not after how much they dogged on Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix. Overly dogged and overly anti-hyped, in my opinion, that maybe getting something that is probably a well-honed movie would be too much of a shock for these people who have jumped on the MCU bandwagon and saying that Kevin Feige is going to do justice to the X-Men. I mean, please, come on, let's just tone it down for a second here. It is going to be kind of a shame if we never get to see it, and if it is cursed, I will gladly be in a theater when it comes out and catch that curse. And before we move on, I do want to bring up one unfortunate and very sad news topic which is that the great actor Max von Sydow did pass away this week and I know he is such a storied actor with so much range with so much impact on cinema with his roles and all the films he was a part of but to me probably the biggest two roles he had were in the Flash Gordon movie as Ming the Merciless and in the Judge Dredd movie, the original Sylvester Stallone one as Chief Justice Fargo. Those are two incomparable, magnificent roles. He became Ming the Merciless and he became Fargo. And Fargo in particular is one of the most enigmatic roles I've ever seen on screen as a child. To say that the Judge Dredd movie was one of my favorite movies growing up is an understatement. I used to watch that thing on repeat and Chief Justice Fargo was always the light, was always a highlight. His scenes trying to mentor Dredd, taking the long walk into the cursed earth, and him finally meeting up with Dredd after bidding down the Angel family, all gold. And I will always associate him with that role. I know, he was in the Seventh Seal. But to me, when I think of Max von Sydow, I will think of Chief Justice Fargo. And if I don't think of Chief Justice Fargo, I will think of Ming. The way he carries himself with grace, with menace, and with true authority, it's magnificent. And even though that is a movie that I don't really like that much as like an adaptation, I do think it doesn't quite bring justice to the original Alex Raymond comic strips. Side out is one of the best parts of it. He captures all of what that character is supposed to be as a villain, as a force of nature. And so it is really, really saddening to hear that he has passed away and such a part of my childhood is gone in an instant like that. The only respite is that he lived a long storied and completely iconic life and he received so much respect in his days and so I hope he is resting in peace and that his family and loved ones get some closure and some rest as well. So I want to do a moment of silence if you would allow me. All right so rest in peace Max von Sydow. We'll miss you. And so now we can move on to what I read this week. 
First off, we have Hawkman number 22. This was a bit of an oddball issue. It did a lot of interesting things, but in ways that wasn't really something I enjoyed. What it does well is that it takes more strides towards bringing Hawkman into the fold, like finally taking proactive stances with the small plot beads and threads that Venditti has seeded throughout the run, but hasn't truly capitalized on yet. That gets me excited. It was cool enough that she was taking the lead while Sky Tyrant filled the space of antagonist, but finally reaping those plot hooks means that the possibilities for where the series might take these two is now fully open. It's really enticing. What draws and drags all this back though is some really dull and uninspired writing. Like Venditti wants to put Hawkwoman, you know, Shaira into a position where it's almost like Clarice and Hannibal Lecter, except he's not skilled enough to write that dynamic, and so it makes Hawkwoman look very blockheaded, very dumb, and really underthought in order to push up the stakes. It's kind of disappointing to see that play out, and I have a hard time believing that this was even Shaira, or even in character. So that does give me pause for how well Venditti is going to handle this character moving forward. Maybe it's just a rough spot, but it could be indicative of larger problems. So fingers crossed for the former. Honestly though, it's still nice to see Adam and Adam Strange around some more. Kudos to them. They fill up this cast and this roster really well, like I said, and they highlight the issue being this huge spread that spotlights Shaira's various reincarnations, mirroring the one we got for Carter way back in the first arc. So that was nice, and it was cute. It's nice to see them bouncing off each other again. Hopefully, we can move past this insanely insipid little back and forth that she had with Sky Tyrant and get somewhere that is actually very incisive and, you know, cuts through to the bone for this character. So, fingers crossed. Overall, two thumbs middle. Next up, we have Captain Ginger Season 2, Number 2, and this was a lot better than the premiere, we found out. Doubt. The premiere issue had a sluggish atmosphere to it, as though it didn't really feel like it needed or had to say anything much at all. Even though it definitely needed to push things up to a new level, it felt very reluctant to do so. It felt like a middle issue of an already thinned out run. This issue though, feels more like a first issue than that one did, where we have a big inside incident, strong character beats to help to redefine these characters or bring them into sharp relief for anyone that might have forgotten them within the hiatus. It's actually pretty shocking how well this one flows when you put it to that mindset. It's still not perfect, but it leaves everything open for more. Like it actually has a hook that propels you or at least wants you to dig more into the story and it works. It really does. And all this is why it's still a bit shocking when you realize that this season is pretty much already halfway over. It feels like it's been wasting time and after such a staunchly adamant first season, you know it can do better. You know it can be a little bit more engaging, a little bit more impressive, and a little bit more immersive than this. And the fact that it isn't so far is a bit disappointing. The characters' dynamics and drama are there, but not much else that gives you that same confidence. I can't wait for the next issue, which is a good sign, and I hope that with those two, we can get more of an actual story and narrative going. Because overall, one thumb up, one thumb middle. And please just don't let my expectations for this series go down the drain. And finally, we have the Immortal Hulk number 32. Now, this was a good issue. It takes what was set up and intimated by the previous issue and makes sure you understand the full extent of it. Somehow, Ewing and Bennett have made a Zemnu purpose built for the modern age. For all of our neurotic millennial, this effective and comfort seeking generation. And it works. It's almost too perfect. It's a plot that came out of the tail end of two different movies about the life of Mr. Rogers, for God's sakes. Like, two years after people made a total out of Bob Ross and ensuing ASMR style painting show. It's mind-blowing how well this plot, this character, this these themes tap into the cultural zeitgeist. It's, it's impressive and if you had told me that Ewing had time travel to make sure that Zemnu had a story back in like the 70s where he had a kid's show like Barney, I would have to mull it over because it slots in just way too perfectly, too neatly to be coincidence. And that's what makes this issue work so stylistically because it puts us in the frame of television, of our media consumption, and how Zemnu affects and infects all of that. It's cool and it's instantly as iconic as he's ever been. Other highlights Lights is how well the scientist character has been integrated into the story, which is probably more cleanly than the reporter had been, honestly, and how all of this affects Bruce. Zemnu plays with identity and perception, and with Bruce, his perception is his identity, so it takes so little to make him go over the edge, and that's fun, and he wigs out with the best of them. I'm still enjoying this book, and I can't wait to see where this goes, and how the hell the leader will make sense out of it. But what we have right now is something that is definitely going to be better in the trade. It's something that I wish felt more substantial. The themes are hitting really hard, and that's what I like more about this book, is that even though a lot of the issues may feel very decompressed, there's a huge problem with decompression in this run, and it's issues like this that kind of hit you over the head with it. But I do think that there is a great thorough line here and this issue for all of its faults for how unsubstantial it feels as like something you can read it really does just 
slap you in the face and kind of shake you saying, look at this. Isn't this insane? And it has the chops to prove it. So two thumbs up. I'm enjoying the hell out of this run. I can't wait to see more. I can't wait to see how the maniacal Robert Banner deals everything and what happens with Zemnu. So fingers crossed that it turns out really well. And finally, we can head on to what I watched this week, which is Bloodshot of all things. And it's a movie that has shockingly turned out to maybe the last or only comic book movie released this year. And well, to get spoiler free thoughts out of the way, it's okay. It's not unwatchable. It's just mediocre kind of tepid and not very cinematic either in its presentation style or narrative it's limp when it should be exciting and empty when the plot should be ramping up or when the storytelling should be getting substantial i know this phrase gets turned around a lot but it really does feel like a pilot to a tv show you know like a special two-hour premiere pilot where you get just enough budget to look cool and exciting but not enough to actually raise expectations too high for the rest of the series where it's going to be inevitably short simple one and done plots i mean there's basically two sets in the whole movie and they make sure to get the most out of them it's a big contributor to why this movie feels so small and low scale and uneventful because it is small low scale and uneventful there's nothing really at stake here other than the main character becoming free except it's from a, such a petty and needless situation and it's not even in a darkly satirical way like Robocop theory of Dick Jones the villain in Bloodshot just has a vaguely douchey ego and that's about it it's about like making sure his stock price goes up it's so lame and just uninspired it's not enough to hang a story on and it's definitely not enough to hang character beats or a character arc on and that's what the movie is banking on it's banking on you really connecting with Vin Diesel and Vin Diesel's fine here he's you know, Vin Diesel. You get what you expect from him. But in order for like an actual motive connection, there's not enough drama. There's not enough like tension. There's not enough heart to it. It's not hardening enough to be like, oh wait, this guy just wants to get his stock price up and there's only like two big action sequences. All right. See, there's not enough there to drive you on to really place the audience in the position of like danger, threat, chaos, like kind of, you know, really connecting with anything around it. And that's a shame. It really is. And I mean, the Robocop reference is pretty apt because it steals the scene almost straight out of Robocop 2 and I'm not even joking. So yeah, what this all results in is a pretty average, slightly dull, but not unbearable or even bad movie. It just exists. The only thing I would call actively terrible about it is, well, that it has insanely bad pacing and emptiness. The emptiness just means that the movie just kind of trudges along with no atmosphere with no energy with no enthusiasm for itself but then it'll force the movie to get suddenly rolling because it has to force it because there's no actual foundation here every act of the movie pretty much begins with a huge info dump to try and brute force a narrative where there is none and it's obvious every time like hey time for huge position from a character that's being introduced or hey time for huge position that explains the story and like you could have seen this out but there's no time to see this movie out because there is no storyline because there is no plot because there is no actual storytelling existing here it's like action scene cliche beat action scene cliche beat and it never works it fumbles every time there's maybe one thing the movie does that feels like it could have had some weight it's at the very end and it's obvious as hell but if they had stuck to their guns it could have worked it could have been like you know what i'm glad they had the balls to do that but they negate it 10 seconds later and well that was obvious too overall it's trying to capture the same niche as Venom, you know, early 2000s comic movie storytelling atmosphere and energy. But Vin Diesel is no Tom Hardy. And even Tom Hardy needed Ruben Fleischer. It's definitely trying there. And maybe it'll work for a lot of people. I don't see this being a movie that is outright hated. But it's definitely something that you probably should only watch on a rainy day. So, two thumbs middle, overall score, 5 out of 10. And lastly, we reach our listener questions. We had two listener questions. I already answered the first one at the beginning of this episode with the news topic. And our last question is from at Rollover Queen on Twitter. I'll link his Twitter below as well as his YouTube channel. He does a lot of comic reviews, comic topics. So please check him out. He also does a weekly stream on Fridays. Join on in. They are a huge blast if you like anything relating to like comics, superheroes, mechas, that kind of thing. He's a really great resource for that. So just shouting him out. And his question is, what are my thoughts on Fast 9 being pushed back? And thankfully, honestly, I think it's a good move. I think it's a smart move because they really do want at least Fast 9 and Fast 10, which I think are the last two movies that the main cast is signed up for from their huge contracts. They want them to feel like an event and they desperately want it to feel like an event because they even had the release trailer be in this mega concert that was honestly kind of pathetic but it was an attempt it shows just where the studio has expectations for this movie to be and i believe that delaying it another year is what the doctor ordered 
because it's something that is going to get fans more and more riled up. It's kind of like what people said that they had hoped that Marvel would take like a couple years off after Endgame to sort of let people get excited again to build up anticipation. And I think that delaying it a full year, not even a full year, like a little more than a year even, is going to do that. I think people are going to be like frothing at the mouth just to see what's going to go on. And now that we know that Han is back, now that we know the Drift King is back, now that we know it's going to be kind of like a Logan-y thing. They were trying to hit some Logan style like themes and beats in that trailer. You know, I think it's going to work out. I think it's going to be you know better for the series in the long run. It's a shame because apparently it's taking Fast 10's release spot. So that means we're going to have to wait another year for that. But if they play their cards right, if the movie really is that good, if it really is that exciting, and if they do have more to show in the marketing to lead up to that, to build that hype, to build that excitement, then you know what? I think that they should have done it even without the coronavirus, without these fears. They really should have waited a little bit more because we did have like Fast and Furious 8 and Hobbs and Shaw like back to back. It was getting a little oversaturated. So we do need some time to miss this series a little bit. And now that we have, we can welcome it back. So hopefully 2021 is a year without much danger at all. And so thank you for that question, Ro. It's it's a great question. I'm so glad when I get like weird off the wall questions on the show that aren't pertaining to comics per se. So thank you so much. It was great answering that question. I also want to say thank you to Nott for his question at the beginning of this episode too. That was fun as well because it's it's cheeky and even though I like New Mutants, but you know, it's nice to take some riffing on that as well. Before I move on, there was also one last thing, which was that AkiCat on Twitter didn't have a question, but they did want to wish us all the best well wishes all around. And so thank you so much. That means a lot in these trying times. Back at you, AkiCat, and I hope you're doing well too. And I want to say thank you to everyone out there who's ever sent in a question, comment, or topic to the show. It means so much to me. It's so humbling, and I'm so grateful. So thank you so much. And if anyone out there has their own question, comment, or topic you want to hear discussed on our show, you can always find me on Twitter at T-H-E underscore S-N-I-C-K-M-A-N. I want to give a shout out to the cover artist at D-O-T-E-M-C-E. Please check them out. They're awesome. And give them all the follows that they deserve. Anyway. Thank you so much for listening. This was the 99th episode. Next week is going to be episode 100. It's been a wild ride. I can't believe we're finally heading into triple digits. See you there. Have a great week.